All right, guys, on today's lecture, we're going to be entering into a brand new time period, um, which in the College Board's uh, curriculum is called Time Period 2. Um, you'll also hear it called the Classical Period um, or the Iron Age. And over the course of this time period throughout our learning targets, we're going to be focusing on uh, several really large empires. The empires that we're going to focus on in the coming weeks are uh, Persia, and Greece, which we'll talk about today. We'll also discuss Rome, uh, the Han Dynasty in China, and the Maurya and the Gupta uh, empires of India. So let's go ahead and kind of set this um, Iron Age into its framework. Um, again, this is AP World Time Period 2, and the dates for this time period run from 600 BCE to 600 CE. And throughout this time period, what you want to kind of ask yourself is, why did the College Board make these specific dates into a time period? There must be some kind of things that distinguish it from the previous time period, and there's got to be something different about this time period that distinguishes it from um, time period number three. So kind of consider that. Um, one of the big things that I think distinguishes this time period is the advent of iron. Iron metallurgy begins a really long time ago, about 1500 BCE, with a group called the Hittites. They were actually way back on your um, time period one. Um, they were way back on your time period one um, targets, and uh, if you go back, you can see them. They're in. Um, I think it is 1.32 B, and that target is actually about the Hittites. So what iron allows you to do is basically be more coercive than groups that were using bronze. Um, and what happened was, through the use of iron metallurgy, empires are going to become um, much larger and more coercive. And they're going to take over and rule over multiple people groups. So you won't just have a state, which is one people group or one type of culture under the rule of a centralized government, you will have actual empires, which kind of implies diversity. So again, why is this time period special? Mostly because iron allows a different kind of political structure and social structure and cultural structure to suddenly exist. So iron is kind of the root of all of these change, um, of all of these changes. The government is going to definitely be get, uh, get a lot larger um, they'll encompass more people, and of course, with having more people, it's going to be more complex. You'll see that the bureaucracies of these classical period empires is going to be a lot better than the bureaucracies that we saw in the Bronze Age. Those were pretty rudimentary. Um, I wanted to put a giant leech on this slide, but it was just too gross. I looked up pictures on Google Image. You can do it. It's just nasty. So I was going to put a big leech on here because... What you should think of an empire as is pretty much a leech. What an empire does is extract resources from conquered peoples. That is the goal of an empire. Now, they might cover up that goal with um, kind of pretty little lies or an ideology that makes it seem like it's going to be something different. But in fact, the goal of an empire is to extract resources from peoples that they conquer. That's one of the reasons that they need to be so coercive through the use of iron weapons. Um, another really cool thing about this time period is that the populations really start to skyrocket. Um, during the classical period, 600 BCE to 600 CE, you will actually see the first cities of about a million people, um, Xi'an in China and Rome. Both uh, grow to about a million people during the time period. Mostly this is about uh, better plows. Uh, iron plows can get through more difficult soil. That means that more soil is put under cultivation um, and the amount of arable or farmable land becomes greater. So you have more food and therefore you get more babies and more people. So the population is going to grow up, go up at the same time that governments are going to kind of uh, become more centralized and more controlling over their populations because they need to have a greater amount of control in order to keep together such a big entity like Persia, which covered millions of square miles. All right, our main big questions for time period two, how on earth do they do it? In pre-modern times, how do rulers manage to govern large territories and establish unity, stability, and prosperity? 
I mean, this is a very early, early time frame that we're talking about here. They don't have any modern technology. They don't have any modern roads or communication systems. There's hardly even what we would think of as modern um, infrastructure, although um, they did really well with the kind of technology that they had. Um, so the question is, how did they pull it off? We also want to know how do empires operate politically and socially? So for example, um, what methods of control do different empires use to politically keep a handle on their people? Socially, what does the hierarchy look like? How do you move up or down within it? Is it possible to move up or down within it? How does religion justify a social hierarchy? We also want to look at what kinds of cultural characteristics are seen in empires. The College Board is especially interested in making sure that you think about the ways that elites, especially rulers, use art and culture to promote centralization of their own political power or rule. Um, and then we want to think lastly about um, trade and religion during this time period. What changes occur within religion? And we're going to kind of see a continuation of what we saw with Hinduism. If you'll recall, Hinduism goes from being focused on impersonal gods um, for whom you have to do rituals, and it starts to focus on big questions and a more personal relationship with the gods. So that's going to be a big change in religion. And we're also going to look at trade because the amount of connectedness between these empires really uh, ratchets up during this time period. We go from tiny connections, say between Mesopotamia and the Indus River Valley, to huge uh, thousands, you know, connections over thousands of miles, technically uh, between areas like Rome and Han China, although they were not directly connected, they were connected via intermediaries across huge uh, expanses of land. All right, our first empire that we're going to be discussing is Persia. This is a map of Persia in around 500 BCE, and um, I want you to focus on a couple of different things. First of all, uh, Persia has taken over um, Egypt and the very fertile Nile Valley all the way down into what was at one point Nubia. So this is a very fertile area. A lot of uh, grain comes out of it. And capturing Egypt is a great prize for any empire, really right up until the modern period because it's so productive agriculturally. Um, let's see, over in the east, here's the Indus River. Persia extends all the way to the Indus River and it extends up here into what is today Central Asia. This area um, called Bactria um, is um, known for being pretty arid. A lot of pastoralists kind of live up in this area. Here's Mesopotamia. Persia had conquered the ancient, most ancient region of civilization. And then over here, uh, the Anatolian Peninsula. They conquered that and a lot of these little islands right here along the coast. And I want to point this out because right here is modern Greece. And ancient Greek civilization is actually focused on this peninsula down here uh, called the Peloponnesian Peninsula. And there's going to be some conflict between this tiny area full of city-states and this huge monster empire. Um, again, they have the same problem that every single classical period empire has, which is how on earth do I unify, rule, and centralize my control of this huge expanse of land. Um, Persia is going to use a, dot, a lot of different methods of unification and I want you to put a star beside um, this portion of your notes and I want you to know on your paper in pen, I've noticed that some of you aren't writing the notes out to the side that I'm asking of you, so make sure that you do that please. And out to the side of methods of unification, I'd like you to note that many of these methods are common to all of the empires. Many of these methods are common to all of the empires. Persia is not the only one who's going to struggle with the issue of how to keep together their empire. So these big ideas about how to um, unify are going to be used pretty much by everybody. The first idea is to use a common religion. Sometimes you'll hear this called a common ideology. You need to um, make sure that your people kind of are thinking along the same lines as you, the centralized government. Now in Persia, the common religion and ideology is monotheistic Zoroastrianism. We talked about that last week. Um, Persia encourages conversion to Zoroastrianism, but it does not impose it. And um, 
just to give you a refresher, Zoroastrianism was a monotheistic religion that believes in this huge cosmic battle between Ahura Mazda, the good guy, and Ahriman, the evil guy. Um, the Shah, or the king of Persia, is sort of the representative on earth of the white hats, the good guys. Okay, And um, they have a lot of rituals. Strayer in the textbook talked about um, rituals having to do with fire, and those are still around um, in Zoroastrian uh, communities today. Now, what the Persians learned from this is that tolerating people's religions and cultural traditions is a good thing when you're trying to keep control of a huge expanse of land. A lot of empires are going to end up practicing toleration because it's easier than trying to impose one ideology on everyone and then making all the different people kind of hate the central government. Um, Persia is viewed by most populations that they conquer as uh, kind of a good guy because they let them continue, uh, they let all these diverse groups continue their religious practices, continue their marriage regulations, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that ends up being a really effective method of control. Uh, the second method to unify a large empire is having good communications, or at least as good as you could at the time. Royal roads are built. There was an illustration in your Strayer text of the royal roads that went from kind of north of the Persian Gulf all the way um, to the western end of Anatolia. And they were built to connect the empire, and this does two things. First, Persia was not averse to laying the smackdown on people. If you revolted, they wanted to be able to get to you so that they could smash your rebellion. They also um, were interested in promoting economic prosperity because usually when people are economically prosperous, they are happy because they have money and luxuries. Um, in this picture, I thought it was kind of a cool, uh, cool thing to show. We see two Persian magi, and uh, magi are um, Zoroastrian um, clergy, pretty much priests. And um, here in this photo, you can, or in this picture of a relief, a stone relief, you can see them with their um, mouths covered, and they're holding these little sticks. Um, I think it's fun because, of course, a lot of students know about the story of the three wise men or the three magi. They're actually Zoroastrians in the uh, biblical story. Okay, a third um, idea that will really help you unify your empire is to delegate power. What happens is the Shah, in the case of Persia, or the emperor, in the case of most empires, is going to directly give some of his power to governors who are in outlying territories. And in every empire's case, I really don't know of any empire that doesn't, they're going to divide up their territory into what are called provinces. And each of these provinces is going to be ruled by a governor, or in the case of Persia, a satrap. Royal roads had couriers, uh, little guys on horseback that would take imperial messages with a ton of speed all the way out to the satraps and um, they would return uh, messages from the satraps to the capital um, where the emperor had his court. And um, our United States Post Office actually has as its motto a, a quote from a Greek historian Herodotus, uh, Strayer talked about it in your book, uh, about how these couriers and this imperial uh, message service would go no matter what the weather was, whether rain or sleet or snow or hail, so all of these royal roads and these messengers really was able to, were able to connect the satraps, the governors, with the capital and the emperor. The emperor also definitely displayed his power. Persepolis was the capital. There were these huge monumental structures. Um, I'll show you a picture of a ruins in just a second. And empires are going to also use their size to their advantage. And what I mean by this is they're going to do things that a large empire is able to do well. That a small empire really isn't able to do. For example, a large empire can impose a unified coinage, and you can see on the right um, a Persian coin with some Zoroastrian uh, fire image on it. This makes trade a lot easier. It um, decreases barriers between different groups who are trying to make um, money transactions, and it definitely bolsters the economy, making again everybody happier. Empires are also going to make their taxation regular and in predictable amounts, meaning like Mrs. Booth would know every year in April I owe three bushels of grain. 
per acre of land that I have. And that ability to predictably say what my taxes would be and when is going to keep me a lot happier as a subject of that empire. They're going to pay their taxes because it's not arbitrary, it's not random, there aren't people coming to my house in the middle of the night trying to take my stuff for random taxes that I didn't know about. Um, all of that leads to stability and predictability, and all of that uh, leads to a really strong, stable, unified empire. So again, use your size to your advantage, um, ensure stability, predictability, and your citizens will be happy. Here's Persepolis. I think you can kind of see there's a little pit, a person right there. You can kind of get an idea of the size. This is the audience hall of um, the King of Persia. And you can see, let's see, a person would probably be about up there uh, on on this main wall. So it's a really intimidating structure. And the interesting thing about this is that it actually mixes a lot of the different architectural styles of the areas that Persia had conquered. Their art uh, looks a lot like Mesopotamian art, but these arches look a lot like stuff from Egypt. So per Persia was good at incorporating the culture of their uh, of the people that they were conquering, which made them again a lot more unified and stable because they were able to be tolerant. All right, you can also um, create an ideology of kingship. Everybody does this. We saw this from way back in the Bronze Age. The Shah is the representative of uh, the gods on earth, or god on earth in the case of Persia. Um, and last but not least, try to keep your people happy. This is a point to star. So on number seven, the first bullet, please star this technology, the Quanat system, is a specific piece of curriculum that the college board um, wants you to know. They're just underground irrigation canals. Uh, it decreases water evaporation, which means that your fields won't get uh, salty as quickly. If you don't have as much evaporation, um, the water's not leaving behind so many uh, salty minerals. And then over time, you don't get a salinized field. So Aquana is a really, really awesome invention. Um, when Muslim conquerors come out of the Arabian Peninsula in the uh, 700s and conquer Persia, they're actually going to adopt a quantit system and spread it throughout their empire. So it's going to be widely adopted. Uh, anytime you've got more food, you've got more happy people. That's a good thing. And they're also going to keep people happy by incorporating elites that they had conquered into their bureaucracy and into their elites. So Persia worked hard to um, basically assimilate the elite populations, aka make the elite populations a part of the Persian uh, social hierarchy, which kept them happy. All right, Strayer also talked in the reading that you did recently about the Greek city-states. These were small, they were not united, they competed with each other 24-7. Now they did have some cultural unity through their religion, language, and some fun uh, competitions, athletic competitions called the Olympics, which actually began in the 700s BCE. Greeks uh, mostly focus their economic um, energies on sea-based trade. Uh, if you'll remember from the summer reading on wine, we learned that the Greeks um, spread their wine and vineyards and wine culture throughout the Mediterranean. One of the reasons they did this is because their land was so marginal. They really didn't have good farmland, so they needed to find a different way to make money. They grew grapes, exported wine, and actually imported um, grain back into the Greek city-states. Um, the Greeks had a really interesting political system centered around something called the polis, or the city-state. Pretty much, if you were a guy and you were born in... Athens or any other city-state, you would be considered a citizen as long as you had not been born a slave or a woman, heaven forbid. So citizens had both responsibilities, for example, to serve as a hoplite in the military and also rights within the community. For example, the ability to get together in the public forums and have debates and vote. Um, they were not considered subjects of a king in the way that Persian uh, subjects were considered um, subject to the will of the Shah. Now, it is extremely important to note, and I want you to star the second bullet under Greek politics. Please star it. Not everyone was equal. 
women had very few rights. According to the writings of Aristotle, women are actually partially formed men. So the Greeks have very low opinion of women. Um, although in Sparta, it was slightly better. Although Sparta had a, uh, Sparta the city-state had a group of conquered peoples uh, in the land that they had uh, conquered and ruled over called Helots, who basically lived their lives as agricultural slaves, which allowed the Spartans to train militarily pretty much 24-7. Um, even in Athens, which most um, Westerners, meaning Europeans and Americans, Canadians, um, most Westerners consider Athens kind of the home of democracy, but even in Athens, only about maybe a third or a half of the population is even considered citizens or eligible to have um, any participation at all. And that's the maximum amount. Um, I think a third is a little bit of a better um, estimate. Most leaders and as well, most of the high ranking people are gonna be men of wealth. However, um, it is unique to have the concept of a citizen, a person with rights and responsibilities within the state to be voting and eligible to serve. And the amount of um, people and ability to serve and have a participating say in the government really increases throughout the 400s BCE when, um, when uh, Athens and the other city-states are fighting in the Persian Wars. Basically, the men who fight as hoplites against the Persians in the 490s and 480s push to have more rights. They're saying, um, if we are allowed to fight, then we should be allowed to have a voice in our government. It's really similar to um, what happened um, right after the Vietnam War in the United States. Uh, the voting age was lowered to 18 because that was the same age as, as the draft. So you can kind of see that um, once people are required to kind of do things for their state, they also would like to have a voice in their state. This is just an artist rendition of uh, what the Acropolis or the main hill surrounding Athens looked like uh, during the Golden Age. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So back in the day, Persia was a big empire. The Greek city-states were trading and doing their thing. I hope that you remember back on the map of Persia that Persia owned a lot of islands that bordered what uh, were the Greek city-states. And what the Greeks attempted to do is increase their own influence and they worked to help cities who were conquered by the Persians on that area that bordered Greece to throw off imperial rule by revolting. Um, Persia invaded that area around Greece to try to ensure their rule and their goal was to kind of teach Greece a, a lesson for um, helping um, these Greek, uh, these other city-states to revolt. Um, and very surprisingly, the Greeks were able to win a series of battles throughout two major campaigns um, over about a 10-year period. You might have heard of the Battle of Marathon, where the modern running event gets its name from, Thermopylae. Uh, Salamis is a big naval battle. Uh, that Athens was able to win, they were actually able to kick Persia out of the area. Now, for Persia, this was no big deal. Um, it was on the very edge of their empire. It wasn't the main force of their military that was engaged in it um, for the most part, and uh, they didn't. They weren't really worried about that. It wasn't like Greece was invading Persia and taking it over. However, the Greeks really were super excited about their victory. Um, and they write all kinds of different documents that talk about how they're fighting for their freedom. Um, after this war ends, something called the Delian League was formed. The Delian League is just a group of Greek city-states, and they're all going to pay dues to Athens to um, ensure that everybody is protected against um, a further Persian invasion. Now, in fact, Persia never comes back. Um, they never invade Greece after the 480s BCE. But Athens continues to collect all these dues from all the Delian League members, and it finances their Golden Age, which runs um, from about 480 to about, say, 420-ish uh, BCE. And this is the age of um, all the different philosophers that you're probably familiar with. Um, the buildings of the Acropolis right over here um, is the uh, Parthenon. They're rebuilt. Over here, um, we see um, some really famous columns called the Caryatids. 
their um, artistic forms are fully developed by the golden age. And uh, right here we see a painting from the 1700s by a French artist named Jacques-Louis David, but it's depicting uh, the, the death by drinking hemlock of this guy who's pointing up. Uh, this guy is Socrates, one of the most famous Greek philosophers, and he's pointing up because, mm, in a very simplified form, sometimes he's, he's saying that sometimes uh, ideas and ideals are uh, more important than life, and he was sentenced to die, um, I think you remember, hopefully from your story reading, by the Athenian government for uh, corrupting the youth uh, by making them question authority and things like that. And uh, here he's getting ready to drink hemlock, and obviously his followers are very sad. All right, Greek Golden Age philosophy. This is extremely important. We need to know about Greek um, ways of thinking. The use of reason, reason, logic, questioning, and debate is extremely important. The goal is to look at the world around you through observation. Use your eyes. Um, this idea is advocated by Aristotle, and Aristotle pretty much says that uh, you should collect evidence using your senses, and you should use it to understand what truth is. Um, they're definitely going to try to explain the process of power, the natural world. Um, they pretty much want to explain why the world is the way it is. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle are the three most important Greek philosophers, um, and we don't really have time to focus on them very much, other than to say the College Board wants you to know Aristotle by name, as well as his belief in the importance of uh, observation and taking in evidence to form a reasoned opinion. Um, Plato and Aristotle are in many ways uh, opposites from each other. Uh, Plato had some crazy ideas. Uh, he believed that uh, everything that exists in our sensory world has a perfect uh, form up in a place that he calls the realm of the forms. And so there's like a uh, perfect version of notebook paper, and it floats around in the realm of the forms. And then everything that we see on our Earth is sort of an imperfect uh, shadow of this, um, of this perfect form world. And you might have heard of the allegory of the cave. Uh, if you haven't, go ahead and Google it uh, after this lecture. Look up the allegory of the cave or Plato's allegory of the cave. Um, and he's really explaining his philosophy of the idea world or the realm of the forms in that, um, in that, um, in that little story. Aristotle thinks his idea is crazy. Uh, he thinks Plato's um, off his rocker. And he says, no, no, no. Um, just look with your eyes, see what you can see, and use your observations and your senses to understand the world around you. Greeks are also very well known for their building style. If anyone has been to Washington, D.C., our um, entire capital is built in a Greek style. This is also called the Hellenistic style, after the Greeks' name uh, for themselves, which is the Hellenes. Um, and it's got a bunch of columns. You can see it on the right. All these columns, there's a pediment. Um, it's extremely symmetrical, so that might be something that you'd like to um, star. Their statues are very human-like, but idealized, and um, they look like um, people in a way that things like medieval art, for example, in Europe doesn't look like <laughs> doesn't look like people. They're kind of funky looking. Uh, the Greeks tried to replicate the perfect human form, um, and uh, they really had ideas um, about or they really highly valued humans, I guess is the best way to put it. They really highly valued humans. They thought we had a lot of potential um, and a lot of um, brain power, for lack of a better word. We could understand and manipulate our world through reason, and that really caused them to celebrate um, humans through some really cool artwork. Here's another Greek temple. Again, you can see the um, columns. Um, these are called the uh, Ionic Order They've got these little scrolls on the end. Um, they have always got a triangle on top. And again, it's ridiculously symmetrical. I can fold it in half and it's the same on one side as it is on the other. Greek theater. Um, this, you can see how big it is based on this. You can still go to some Greek theaters. There's still a few around, uh, either built by Greeks or Romans. Um, North Africa is actually a really good place to see um, authentic Greek and, um, and Roman theaters. Roman, I suppose, more than Greek. 
All right, last but not least, uh, Alexander the Great. So, um, if you'll recall, we were talking about the Delian League, how Athens collected dues from all of its members, and it um, said that it would use those dues to protect the Greeks from a further Persian invasion, which never came, and instead Athens used all that money to build all their fancy buildings and create their fancy artwork. Um, eventually, everybody in Greece got really mad, and there was a war called the Peloponnesian War between mainly Athens on one side and their allies and Sparta on the other side with their allies. And they fought over who was going to kind of lead the Delian League, and Sparta wanted to break up the Delian League, and Athens said, no, we don't want you to because, you know, they were taking money from everybody. It was great for them. Um, after a really long time, several decades, Athens and Sparta, along with their allies, really just beat each other to a pulp. Technically, Sparta wins, uh, but nobody really wins. Both of the city-states are exhausted and their resources are depleted at the end, and there is a power vacuum um, in the area. And into that power vacuum will step a person who we know as Alexander the Great, but who at the time was known as Alexander of Macedon. Macedonia is an area that's just to the north of the Peloponnesian Peninsula in Greece. And you can see that by this time, we are now in the 300s BCE. So we are outside of Athens' Golden Age. We are um, in the period following the Peloponnesian Wars between Athens and Sparta. And Alexander and, uh, the Great is going to take his Macedonian army down to the south, and he's going to conquer and unify the Greek city-states, and then give them a vision of empire. And he will take uh, his huge army, and um, he will cross um, to Egypt, he'll cross to Mesopotamia, he will invade and conquer the Persian Empire, um, and he'll create an empire that goes from the Adriatic Sea, which is the sea in between um, Italy and Greece, all the way to the Indus River. So it's even bigger than Persia was. Now, Alexander the Great dies very young. He's in uh, his early 30s. Um, he didn't live a very healthy life. Uh, you can imagine he was probably a pretty um, manly kind of guy. Uh, <laughs> but um, the legacy of what he did allows the spread of Greek culture, their architecture, their art forms, and the, the use of logic. This process is called Hellenization. You need to do something very exciting around that word Hellenization. It is a word that you'll need to remember all year. Um, it just means to adopt Greek-like culture. Here's Alexander the Great's empire. You can see it covers even more territory by a little bit than Persia did. And here's some examples of Hellenization. These are all statues of the Buddha from areas around India, but the way that the Buddha is depicted is very naturalistic, and the drapery of the Buddha's clothes looks just like um, a Greek statue did uh, from the Greek Golden Age. So that is Hellenization in action. Even in India, uh, the artistic forms are influenced by Greeks because Alexander the Great's empire was so large and because it allowed the culture to spread, Greek culture to spread within it so easily. Um, Alexander the Great, of course, again, dies really young. Um, his empire splits up into four pieces, which you can see right there. Uh, the Ptolemies are the famous ones from Egypt, um, like Cleopatra was actually a Greek, uh, a Ptolemy ruler of, of Greece. Um, but they won't be nearly as strong as Alexander the Great's empire was, um, mostly because their military leaders weren't quite as good. And again, Alexander, was, Alexander the Great was awesome at building an empire, but ruling it was kind of a different story. They just didn't uh, quite adopt the methods that Persia had used um, quite well enough, and um, their empire falls. Rome will eventually take advantage of that disunity and weakness, and it will conquer uh, most of Alexander the Great's empire by um, the period right before we get into the CEs, the 100s BCE. And then Rome will continue that process of Hellenizing the West, and that's why um, you'll see a lot of architecture in Rome is actually imitations of Greek architecture. So when you see a Roman temple with columns, it's just an imitation of Hellenized culture that uh, they're trying to kind of imitate after they'd conquered the Greeks. Now, throughout, again, this Iron Age period, we're going to ask you to think about some really big questions. 
And part of that is to think about what stays the same and what changes. So think about the Bronze Age civilizations like Mesopotamia, um, Egypt, Shang Dynasty, China. As we talk through this unit, think about what is different and what stays the same. I thought of a few ideas for you guys, things like the use of coercion. You could argue that um, all of these civilizations and empires use coercion. But I think in the Iron Age, these um, empires are even better at coercing their subjects through the use of iron and increased centralization um, than they were before. Religion as a unifier um, or a justifying ideology is the same. However, religion becomes more focused, even more focused on answering big questions rather than just doing rituals to appease gods. Um, Bronze Age, this is a big difference. The Bronze Age civilizations were pretty uh, homogeneous. Their cultures and peoples were all similar to one another because they were not that big. Once you hit the Iron Age, empires are going to be huge and diverse, and they're going to have to use new methods like toleration and better bureaucracies to hold themselves together. All right, uh, that's it for today. Um, and um, if you have any questions, please bring them with you to class.